me. I apologize for my delay today. I was over in the clinic trying to improve the outcomes of some of these patients. It was a, a busy clinic day, so I appreciate your patience. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I am from Virginia originally. My dad is a physician and was always a great role model for me in terms of going into that field. And then he actually was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma when I was a first year medical student. I really became interested in lymphomas and blood cancers at that point and then continued to, to have opportunities and, and then ultimately to end up here to be able to focus on blood cancers um, with the oncology uh, the division here at Wild Cornell. So I'm going to focus on the three most common blood cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. Um, oh, sure. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm going to focus on um, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma today. And at the end, I will have uh, leave time for questions and, and uh, any other comments that you all want to make. But if there's something that's unclear while I'm going for, forward with the talk, please feel free to stop, raise your hand and stop me and, and let me know and I'm, I can uh, elaborate as needed. Blood is made up of three main types of cells. Red blood cells, which you see right here, and, and they carry oxygen throughout the body to organs and tissues. Platelets, which are the smaller cells that you see right here, they help the blood to clot in order to prevent bleeding. And then white blood cells are here. There are many different types of white blood cells. Um, they help to fight infection. Blood cells circulate um, through the body after first being made in the bone marrow. So you see a picture of a bone, and this is bones throughout the entire body. In the middle, there's a red section here. That's the bone marrow, and that's where the blood cells are made. Um, so you can see a picture with the what we call precursors or early forms of blood cells, the red blood cells here. The precursors to the platelets are actually very large in the bone marrow here. And then the white blood cells, all of these three cells are made in the bone marrow before they go out into the blood to circulate around the body. And then you see at the bottom picture a blood vessel showing that these three different types of cells are present in the blood. Blood cells then travel um, throughout uh, uh, the lymph node system. So you can see a picture here on the left of all of the different lymph node groups that are spread throughout the body. In the body, um, a larger picture of a lymph node here on the right. And the blood goes through all of these sections. You may remember when you've been sick with a cold or, or um, some other type of infection, you may feel swollen lymph glands, we call them sometimes in the neck. And that's a normal reaction. Uh, but sometimes these cells um, develop abnormalities and, and continue to grow in these spots and, and, and grow into what we call lymphoma. There's another organ that's actually here on the left side, um, we call it the left upper quadrant, called the spleen, and that's often involved in lymphomas and some leukemias also. This, uh, this slide um, shows the different cells as they, as they mature, so that this top part is what's taking place in the bone marrow before the blood cells go out into the blood. And you'll see here what is a stem cell. A stem cell is the earliest type of cell, and it can form into all of the different uh, types of blood cells. And that will be relevant in just a little bit when I talk about stem cell transplant. So here you see a myeloid stem cell and a lymphoid stem cell. And what I want to do is show you from which the different types of blood cancers can develop. So here, and still in a very early phase, which is usually in the bone marrow, leukemias can develop. That's when these types of cells called myeloblasts and, and lymphoblasts start developing abnormally in the bone marrow. And usually we call it leukemia if the disease arises there. There's another disease which I'm not gonna talk about today just because I needed to limit my focus to these three main types of blood cancers. There's another type of disease called myelodysplastic syndrome, which also develops in the bone marrow and can uh, develop into an, a leukemia, uh, but I'm not gonna address that any further today. Uh, so when these cells go out from the bone marrow into the blood, as I pictured in, in the prior couple of slides, um, they're then called lymphocytes. Um, and from this point is where a lymphoma can develop. So there are actually two main types of lymphocytes, B and T. So these two types of cells can form into a lymphoma if something goes abnormal with their production um, at that point in development. 
And then the final um, disease that I wanted to talk about today is called myeloma or multiple myeloma. And that is when this abnormal type of, of white blood cell called a plasma cell develops. That's a later stage of development of a white blood cell. Um, but that actually tends to go back to the bone marrow and affect uh, the cells there. So people with multiple myeloma tend to have a lot of bone lesions and bone pain, as I will talk about in just a little bit. People often ask me, why did I get this disease? What, what are the risk factors for blood cancers? Some of the risk factors that we know of are exposure to radiation. So especially if people have had radiation treatment for prior cancers, like breast cancer. Uh, there are certain types of chemicals, benzene and pesticides, for example, that have been associated with blood cancers. There are certain types of chemotherapies, unfortunately, as you have uh, probably heard in the press before, especially a doxorubicin, which is a medicine that's often used to treat breast cancer, can be associated, it's very low risk, but it can be associated with both the myelodysplastic syndrome I mentioned and uh, acute leukemia. So um, that is something that we watch for uh, in our patients closely who receive chemotherapy. And then etoposide is another type of chemotherapy that can be associated with the risk of blood cancer. There are certain genetic disorders. One is called leaf Raumeni, which can be associated with different types of cancers, including uh, leukemias and lymphomas. And finally, there are some viruses, HIV, hepatitis C, Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that causes mononucleosis, and HTLV-1, which is a virus associated um, uh, an endemic in some Caribbean countries, they have all been associated with some blood cancers. However, in the majority of patients, a clear precipitating factor um, to directly lead to the development in the blood cancer is unknown. And we are working to try to learn more uh, about the causes, but it, in most cases, we really don't know exactly what triggers the development in an individual person. Symptoms of blood cancers, I'm going to break down into the different diseases um, that I've mentioned, but fatigue and weight loss are the most common symptoms that we see in all blood cancers. And leukemia specifically, so a theme that you will see throughout this talk when I show the different cells in the bone marrow, there are the three main types of cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and the red blood cells. Usually there's uh, one of them is abnormal, often the white blood cells are abnormal, and that really affects the quantity of the other <coughs> blood cells, so often there's decreased numbers of red blood cells and platelets in people with leukemia, and the white blood cells don't function normally. So the types of, of symptoms you'll see are bleeding and bruising that people get because their red blood cells and their platelets are low, and sometimes they feel the symptoms that is associated <laughs> with low red blood cells. The other word for that is anemia, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and then recurrent infections are really common with all, with all of these types of blood cancers. Lymphoma has some more specific symptoms that we often call B symptoms, B as in boy, fevers, chills, drenching night sweats, such that one has to take off their pajamas to change them into a different set or change their sheets. Um, sometimes people feel full after eating small amounts, and that's because the spleen, which is the organ on the left side of the abdomen that I mentioned, it gets to be enlarged and it pushes on the stomach sometimes, and it makes it so that people can't eat very large amounts. And then finally, many people with lymphoma actually uh, present with swelling. They're, they're asymptomatic. They otherwise feel, well, I just saw a lady with this situation who had a mammogram, and um, there were some abnormal lymph nodes found on a mammogram, and it turned out to be lymphoma, not related to breast cancer. But she feels 100% normal. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how we manage that type of uh, situation. The last disease I wanted to talk about is myeloma. And again, sometimes we say multiple myeloma. That's because it tends to affect multiple places throughout the body. Sometimes we just call it myeloma, but I mean the same when I use those two terms. Again, because it affects the bone, so commonly, people will often have bone pain or fractures. It also, again, because it affects the bone, it can cause release of calcium into the bloodstream. And when the calcium is high, it makes people feel confused. It can decrease their appetite and cause nausea and vomiting. And ultimately, they are very dehydrated and require a lot of IV fluids in that type of situation. <coughs> 
I wanted to give you some information on general workup of blood cancer. So when, when a blood cancer is suspected, there are certain tests that are done. And then uh, I want to explain exactly why they're done. So the first tests are actual blood tests drawn from the, from the vein. And some of these tests can actually help make the diagnosis of the disease. Um, so what they do, they help us to know what, what are the numbers of the different blood counts. So if someone has a really high white blood count, that can be concerning for a leukemia. And we look to see uh, what the levels of the other blood counts, the platelets and the red blood cells are. We, we want to know how the patient's liver and kidney function are doing because sometimes those can be affected by these diseases. And we can often approximate the diagnosis based on some special lab tests that I mentioned called flow cytometry. That looks at certain proteins on the surface of the white blood cells and helps us to figure out just where along the path of that, that um, slide I showed a couple, uh, couple back where I showed the different blood cells at different stages. And that this can help us diagnose um, which, which disease are we, where, what point are we in the, in the development of the different blood cells. And um, the next test that you... Sure. Are you going to give us a sheet of defining these big terms that we don't know? So the, um, I, could, I could provide that. I don't actually have it, but that's a good idea that if, I, if, um, uh, if there was a way for you all to obtain it, I could, or maybe, I'm not sure if it's able to be posted on the website, but I could, come, I could have a um, list of the definitions to help because I agree that it's hard to, I want to convey all the information, but I know it can be complicated with all of the, these different words. So these two words aren't so um, important to focus on, but I can, we, we can follow up about that later to help you all. Um, bone marrow biopsy is the next test that I wanted to mention, and that is a test where we actually uh, take a piece of the bone, usually from the back, a hip bone. This is a common procedure that we do in our oncology office multiple times throughout the day, and it, I, I compare it to going to the dentist. It's usually, it's not pleasant, but it's something that that is, um, we can give a lot of numbing medicine and make, make as comfortable as possible to help us get the diagnosis. It's a very important test to help us get the diagnosis of leukemia, lymphoma, and, um, and uh, myeloma. And it can help us with the staging of that disease as well, of those diseases. Um, for lymphoma so specifically, it's important for us to do a, what's called a lymph node biopsy. So to actually, and in the most ideal situation, do a what we call an excisional biopsy where we take an entire lymph node. So if someone had a lymph node that was swollen under the arm, our surgeons can actually biopsy, take the entire lymph node, make a small incision, take the entire lymph node. And that's because our pathologists really need as much tissue as possible to help us make the diagnosis and figure out exactly what type of lymphoma it is. So there are, there are many different types of these diseases and it's important that we have the most accurate diagnosis because the treatments are very different depending on what disease it is. Um, in some cases, we will, we will recommend a spinal tap or lumbar puncture. That is a procedure where fluid from the spinal column is obtained um, from, from the back. And that is because some of these diseases can be associated with involvement in the central nervous system or brain and it's important that we be aware of that so that we can target treatment to those areas. Uh, there is an imaging study called a PET scan, PET CT scan, which helps us to understand exactly where the diseases are involved and how active they are. So that helps us with staging at the beginning and it also helps us to be able to gauge the response of the patient to treatment. So we usually repeat the PET scan after a couple of treatments to make sure the treatments are working. And finally, we often do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. And that is done because some of the treatments can affect the heart function and it's not safe to give them at full dose if someone has impaired heart function. The types of treatment for blood cancers include chemotherapy. So I've given a couple of words. Some of this isn't so important for you to know the exact um, words, but I, just to focus on chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is something I'm sure you all have, have heard much about over the years. And chemotherapy is uh, are different, a number of different drugs um, that are indicated for different types of cancers. And um, they ki usually kill cells that are dividing. So, so types of cancers that grow quickly are especially susceptible to being killed by chemotherapy. 
but unfortunately chemotherapy in addition to killing the bad cells often kills some of the good cells and causes side effects um, that can be severe. And so the oncology field and hematology field in, as a whole are working to try to develop more targeted treatments to, to go right to the cancer cell itself so that these other side effects of killing other cells aren't uh, experienced by patients. So I've listed here chemotherapy. You, you'll hear me talk about this later, and I know there's a lot of words here that you don't need to focus on, but 7 plus 3 is an is a abbreviation for a type of leukemia treatment. RCHOP is an abbreviation for a type of lymphoma treatment. And these are all letters that stand for, in RCHOP, different chemotherapy drugs. Some of the targeted drugs, some of the older targeted drugs we have that I'm going to go into more detail about later, one is called imatinib, and that is really revolutionized the treatment of a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia. And then rituximab is a drug that has been incredibly helpful for lymphomas. And there are more and more of these drugs coming out, and we're studying them here at Cornell and, and working with a number of hospitals to try to bring these types of drugs to patients as, um, as quickly as possible to try to, to try to avoid the toxicities of some of the other treatments that we've traditionally given. I want to talk about a stem cell transplant as well. This is something that you may remember the term bone marrow transplant. So bone marrow is, is obtained from the way that I described the bone marrow biopsy just a little while ago. A newer way of doing this type of treatment is called stem cells, and that's something that can actually be obtained by taking it out by, um, from the blood peripherally. And I'll, I'm going to go over a couple diagrams related to that. Um, the two types of stem cell transplants are called autologous, and that's from one's own cells. And I'll explain the rationale for that in just a minute. And the other is called allogeneic. That is when someone has transplanted cells from a different person, often a, a relative. Um, and uh, they're, so these are actually considered immunotherapy. You may have heard of that term, immunotherapy. It's been in the press a lot in the last couple years. And um, essentially what it means is that you're immune system is being manipulated by a treatment in, in order to help your immune system fight the cancer better. Um, so there's some newer immune type therapies that you've probably heard about. Um, one is called checkpoint inhibitors and those essentially turn your T cells, which are a type of lymphocyte, a type of white blood cell, on to help fight the cancer better. And that's being studied in all different types of cancers. Um, and nivolumab is, is one that's actually uh, approved by the FDA for use in some patients with Hodgkin lymphoma that I'll talk about. And there are more of these types of drugs that are being studied in clinical trials, so I expect this to be a really uh, important type of treatment in the future. And then there's a, another type of immunotherapy called CAR T cells, which I'll go over with the diagram in just a minute. Um, and treatment recommendations are made based on a complex set of data. So it's based on blood test information, it's based on information from the bone marrow biopsy and from a lymph node biopsy if that's done. And there are many, um, in addition to, to actually looking under the microscope, having our pathologist help us tell exactly what it looks like, um, we also look at certain mutations and chromosome testing. And there are more and more of this data coming out every day and this is, it's, it's quite complex sometimes to figure out exactly the right treatment. We're working very hard to be able to tailor the exact right treatment for each individual patient. And a lot of it is based on this complex set of information. This is a picture of an autologous stem cell transplant. And so this is actually a, is a treatment that's sometimes used in lymphomas and, and myeloma. And it's used in situations where often where the, the patient did not respond well to the first standard type of treatment, and so um, the, the, they require a more intense approach to cure the cancer. So the way this works, I'm going to start here with the patient. So this is a patient who's received chemotherapy that has gotten the disease under control. Stem cells, as I had showed in that one early slide a bit, a bit back, are the very earliest blood cells, and they can form into any different type of blood cell. So especially in lymphoma and myeloma, these stem cells are not thought to have any component of the cancer. So a patient's stem cells are taken out of the body and then they are actually given even more chemotherapy to rid the body completely of any cancer cells. Uh, and then the stem cells, which are free of cancer themselves, are then infused back into the body and the patient is hopefully then 
completely cured of their cancer. In some diseases like leukemia, it's harder to, um, to get uh, people sometimes into a complete remission where there's no uh, cancer in the body. Um, there is some concern that the patient's own cells would have uh, a tendency to develop uh, into a cancer. So in this case, we um, use a donor, often like I said, a, a either a family member or there is a, a national database, an inter really international um, database of transplant uh, donors. Um, and there are, there are different strategies throughout uh, the world really as far as exactly the right type of transplant for each individual patient, but there's a, and it's a matching process, so sometimes it's a relative. If there's not a relative available, then uh, it can also be a, um, a matched unrelated donor is another type of transplant called MUD. And we're working hard here um, to develop ways for people who don't have uh, related donors um, to, to uh, have uh, uh, some type of uh, uh, stem cells available for them. So another strategy is actually cord blood, so from, um, from umbilical cords that are stored uh, after the birth of babies. And here you see stem cells being collected from a donor. They're, they go through a, a strenuous processing um, and then a patient, di a different person, the patient gets chemotherapy and then gets the stem cells reinfused to then populate their body with a clean set of cells that have no cancer in them. And um, I, I realize this is a bit technical, so I don't want to spend too much um, time on this, but this is a different type of strategy called CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptor T cells um, where uh, a patient who has a really, it can, this can be different types of cancer, but blood cancers in particular have their T cells, a certain type of blood cell um, taken out of the body and uh, in, manipulated in such a way that the T cells can then be reinfused and help to fight the cancer directly. And this is a um, strategy that we've been studying in clinical trials here at Cornell. Okay, I want to go back to more um, basic information about the different diseases. Leukemia can be categorized into acute versus chronic types. And I wanted to show you a picture of, uh, this is actually a, a microscope picture of a leukemia cell. It's, we consider this to be very big um, and um, uh, in relation to other white blood cells. And the purple staining is because of there's a certain dye that is used uh, by our pathologist to, to uh, be able to visualize the different types of cells. And um, this is a leukemia blast, we call it a blast. And then these are red blood cells that you can see around. So there are, um, when, when people have leukemia, um, the, there are increased numbers of abnormal white blood cells that we call blasts. So there are acute versions and, and chronic versions of leukemia. I'm going to talk about three types of leukemia. Acute myeloid leukemia is also called AML. It's the most common leukemia in adults, about 80% of cases. It's still, it's a pretty rare disease. It happens in about 20,000 patients in the U.S. in this year, for example. Is, and um, the, unfortunately, the five-year survival is not very good with this disease. We're working very hard to develop new strategies to, uh, to be added to chemotherapy to try to really uh, get this disease under better control. The five-year survival is only about 25%, unfortunately. Um, the second most common type of acute leukemia in adults is called acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL. And it's actually much more common in children, and it makes up about 20 percent, the other 20 percent of acute leukemias in adults. It, it does, it, it's more rare, only about 7,000 patients in the U.S. per year. But it has a better survival of about 68 percent. I'm going to go through a little more treatment information. Yes? I don't mean to interrupt. Well, sure. I am interrupting. Go ahead. Does chronic lymphocytic leukemia pertain to this? It's a, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. So, we actually view chronic lymphocytic leukemia as more of like a lymphoma. So I'm gonna talk about it more in the lymphoma category. Lymphoma. But people, I just had someone ask me that today who I saw that that's, it sounds, uh, that disease when they hear leukemia, they think it's, it's, sort of, it's like this type of leukemia and it's not. That's really a disease that tends to affect the lymph nodes. It has another name also that's called small lymphocytic lymphoma. 
and it often doesn't cause many problems and can be managed without treatment for many years and we have some other good targeted treatments for it. Um, and, it and the numbers that are given uh, by a doctor in the test, uh, are those numbers important to your survival? Um, the numbers, the I'm not sure blood counts. What the uh, percent or the, or the number, I'm given a number each, each year. Okay. Uh, does it pertain to survival or? So the number of white blood cells that someone has, yes, yes. Um, it doesn't, it, I don't think there's a direct correlation to the number of white blood cells in the survival. What we're doing, we're learning more information about specific mutations and chromosome changes that each individual person has. That tends to be more associated with survival than the exact number of white and blood the cells. The last question, the big question is, when they say you have a zero designation for the disease, that's a good sign. That means it's early, very early stage. Well, if it is that, but would you have to check it all the time to see if it continues to get worse? Or? Usually we will check labs uh, at certain intervals, every three to six months uh, or yearly, depending on how long a person has had uh, that particular finding in their blood counts. With, with the count, but I think we, we need to Move on. Okay. Okay, okay. No, that's okay. I appreciate your questions, and I'll we'll we'll address it more at the end. Okay. Thank you. So I am going to mention one chronic. So what he brought up was called a chronic lymphocytic leukemia that we view more as a lymphoma. So I was actually going to mention that anyway. I'm glad you brought it up. We'll talk about that a little more in a bit. The um, the other type of chronic leukemia is called chronic myeloid leukemia. This is an interesting disease because. It used to be treated much more aggressively. Um, there has been amazing research. It's really viewed as a landmark case and an example for all of oncology, where there's a specific chromosome change that was found to be associated with this disease. And now there's a number of targeted drugs of oral medicines that are used that can that can really put this drug in a, uh, put this disease in a complete remission without the need for aggressive chemotherapy in many cases. It's, it's a rare disease. It's, it happens in about 8,000 people, usually older, though we, do, we definitely see some younger people with this disease. And the, because of the new medicines, the five-year survival is in the 65% range where it used to be much lower. And I would say that number is probably um, lower than, than um, a low estimate because I think people are doing really well with this disease. Um, the first-line treatment of leukemia is, um, and this is, acute myeloid leukemia, the most common type that I mentioned, is this chemotherapy called 7 plus 3. This is a very traditional treatment that's been around for years, and it's given in the hospital. It's infused continuously for seven days, so 7 refers to one of the drugs that's given um, that is given continuously for three days, and the other drug is given for three days of that, of that period of time. And then patients remain in the hospital for really for weeks after that until their blood counts recover. If um, they do go into a complete remission, there's no evidence of the, of the leukemia after that first treatment. In some cases, they will go on to an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, as I had mentioned before, there are many different tests that help us to decide if that's the right strategy for each individual patient. There is one type of, of this disease that's, that's called acute promyelocytic leukemia, which has a very good prognosis and can be treated with uh, oral medicine called retinoic acid and arsenic, which I'm sure you've heard of from the past. And um, these drugs can actually completely cure the patient. So this is a really um, rare, rare subtype, it tends to happen more in young, younger people, but it is curable and it isn't treated with the same chemotherapy uh, model. Acute lymphocytic leukemia, so ALL, that actually can be split into T cell and B cell types also. I'm not gonna mention that so much now, but just wanted you to be aware. There also is chemotherapy given frequently in the hospital for this disease. And um, one important point of this is that it does tend to cause involvement in the central nervous system. And so it's very important that we involve treatment that goes directly into the central nervous system. Many of the traditional chemotherapies do not get into the brain area. So if, if we suspect involvement, we need to do um, imaging like MRIs of the brain and also do testing, like I mentioned, the spinal tap to figure out if people have involvement of the brain. And we give certain types of chemotherapy either directly into the, 
into the spine or um, intravenously at doses that are high enough to get into the brain. Um, this disease also actually involves what we call maintenance therapy. So even after people finish the initial part of the chemotherapy in the hospital, they'll continue taking pills and sometimes getting uh, intermittent intravenous treatments in the outpatient setting. There actually is a certain type of this disease that has the same similar mutation as the disease that I mentioned on the last slide called chronic myeloid leukemia. And if in that case, um, this oral targeted medicine um, is in, incorporated in addition to chemotherapy. And those patients, because they don't tend to do as well, tend to get stem cell transplants, the allogeneic type. Chronic myeloid leukemia, and I think I have a picture here of this very small, I know, but this shows a chromosome change. There are two different chromosomes that get mixed up, and it, and it creates what is called a Philadelphia chromosome. And this Philadelphia chromosome can be targeted by a number of different oral medicines that are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and they target this chromosome. And um, I just listed the names of a few. There are more and more of these coming out. Um, the, the one catch with this is that people often have to stay on those medicines indefinitely. There are studies being done to try to ascertain how, if the disease can remain under control once the pe people come off of these medicines, uh, but for now that many people are staying on them long term. But compared to in prior times, these same people diagnosed with that same disease would have undergone ex intensive chemotherapy followed by a stem cell transplant. And so this is a, a desirable type of treatment strategy. The chronic is less serious than the acute myeloid leukemia, right? Honest, uh, uh, most of the time you're right. Um, uh, most of the time the acute leukemias really require intervention immediately. So I was actually going to make a couple practical issue points regarding acute leukemia treatment. So this, this um, makes your point actually that, that you asked. So, um, what happens is people often present to their doctor with either fatigue, bleeding, bruising, some of the symptoms I've mentioned, uh, and they're found to have usually a very high white blood count, sometimes a very low white blood count. It depends on the person, but that triggers a number of tests to be done and for them to be usually admitted into the hospital to be starting on treatment very quickly. So um, that, then they remain in the hospital for a number of weeks because the chemotherapy that are that they're given causes the blood counts to go down the white blood count to go down and it causes people to be at risk for infection and to require transfusions of blood and platelets to be able to be safe and they aren't safe out of the hospital so that's a lot of the reason why um, it is a, they are very serious and there's something that needs to be acted on right away um, and this is what I just mentioned that they're at increased risk of infection and bleeding um, there are um, other short-term side effects of chemotherapy. Hair loss is very common with most of these chemotherapies. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. And one symptom we watch carefully for is numbness and tingling of the fingers and toes, which can be associated with many chemotherapy regimens. I wanted to mention that uh, clinical trials, including new targeted agents, are, are often being combined with chemotherapy. So we, we don't accept that the 25% five-year survival rate is not good enough. We need that to be better. We're working really hard here uh, to come up with treatment strategies, often in, co in combination with chemotherapy, to improve those outcomes. And um, I also wanted to mention that the search for potential donors for stem cell transplant often begins very early in this process. Even if it's not clear if the patient's <coughs> going to need that stem cell transplant, we want to have that information and be able to move quickly to that if, if we do end up needing it. I wanted to talk a little bit more about lymphoma. So we think of lymphoma in a number of different types of categories. One is Hodgkin lymphoma versus non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, so I had mentioned my dad had Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, it, it is a disease that's fairly rare. It's usually, it's about 10,000 people in the U.S. per year. The survival is very good, 86%. I showed you a picture here. This is called a Reed Sternberg cell. It was, it was discovered many decades ago. Um, and it looks like an owl's eye. That's what it's called. Um, and this is the pathen, what we call pathognomonic or definition of 
uh, Hodgkin lymphoma is to see this Reed Sternberg cell. And it's interestingly, it, it has what we call a bimodal age di distribution, so it can occur in people in their 20s and 30s, and then it again comes uh, and can be diagnosed in people in their 60s and 70s. So um, that, that is, uh, is rare, and most diseases don't have such a um, bimodal type distribution as this. There are certain risk factors that are associated with uh, lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma specifically, HIV, and the, uh, another one that I mentioned earlier in the talk called HTLV1. The first line treatment is called ABVD. You're, you're getting a recurrent theme here that we call chemotherapies, usually abbreviations based on um, the first letter of, of a different drug name, and it's given. Um, so this is four drugs. It's given every two weeks for four to six months, depending on exactly how extensive the disease is. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, if it doesn't work well or if the, t if the cancer comes back, there's still a curative strategy for the second line, and that is another type of chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant. There are some newer agents and newer drugs that are, that are indicated in this disease when, when it doesn't respond well to the first line or second line therapy, and those are called brintuximab, the dotin, and the volumab. I mentioned the volumab before as an immunotherapy. Brintuximab, the dotin, is a, another, it's a drug that's targeted to a protein on the surface of the Hodgkin lymphoma cells. It is now being studied with, a com with the combination therapy at the beginning when people are newly diagnosed. So what we're doing in general is we're uh, the, world, the, the oncology community often studies in clinical trials newer drugs in patients that haven't responded well to the traditional, the tra traditional type of treatments. And then if it shows that it works in that setting, then we sh then try to use it in combination earlier in the treatment. And eventually, if, it, if these drugs work well enough, they may replace the standard of care with a newer type of treatment that works better. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma actually can, comprises about 80 different types or even more uh, lymphomas. So we think of these in a couple different categories also. I've mentioned before B cell versus T cell. There, there's another way of thinking of it that we're more commonly used. I wanted to give you the statistics. So actually non-Hodgkin lymphoma as a whole is the fifth most common type of cancer in the U.S., about 70,000 cases per year with a, a five-year survival of 70%. So you can see these lymphomas have a much better survival than some of the leukemias that I had mentioned. So one of the ways we think of it is called indolent or slow-growing versus fast-growing or aggressive. So I've listed some types of the slower-growing, one of which is what we were discussing earlier, which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We actually consider that a lymphoma. The most common type is follicular lymphoma, and then I mentioned this chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. Um, there's another type called marginal zone lymphoma or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue that can be found sometimes even in the stomach um, that is found while some people undergo endoscopies from the GI doctor um, sometimes. Uh, another disease is called Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. You may have heard of that. We consider that a slow growing lymph lymphoma. And then there are categories of T-cell lymphomas which can affect the skin and are usually very slow growing. These pe the people that have these diseases often don't have any symptoms and it may just be their only symptom is that they feel a lymph node under their arm or they feel, uh, they may actually may not feel any symptoms and they may have had an imaging scan for some other reason, say they had uh, a back pain and turned out to have a kidney stone and they found uh, that there's an enlarged lymph node and it turns out to be a lymphoma. They're not curable most of the time, but they also don't tend to cause many problems or symptoms, so people can live with them for many, many years. I'll go through this in a little more detail on the next slide. The fast-growing lymphomas are aggressive and they do tend to cause symptoms. They can cause the symptoms I mentioned earlier, like fevers, chills, night sweats, pain, um, and the most common is called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, or DLBCL, and this is um, usually a, a, about uh, 40,000 cases per year in the U.S. Um, 
Burkitt lymphoma is another aggressive lymphoma. This is actually more common in children and um, also can be associated with HIV. Mantle cell lymphoma, this is actually a disease that sometimes can be slow growing and sometimes can be fast growing. So we, we put it into the different categories really um, depending on each individual person. Many of people with this disease actually can be watched closely without treatment as well. There's um, two types of T-cell lymphomas that are faster growing called anaplastic large cell lymphoma and peripheral T-cell lymphoma. So many of these aggressive diseases, I, I mentioned earlier that chemotherapy tends to work the best in cells that grow really quickly. So because the cells in these diseases grow quickly, they tend to respond and decrease very well after chemotherapy. And so they are curable, but the treatments are usually pretty intensive. So the treatments I wanted to go over in the, over the two categories. So again, the indolent or slow growing, often asymptomatic. The goal for these diseases is to minimize the side effects and maximize quality of life. Um, we have, there have been studies done that have shown in, in many of these types of lymphomas that earlier treatment does not cause a patient to live longer. So it, it can be very strange for people. In fact, this um, person that I mentioned um, I saw today who was found to have um, swollen lymph nodes on a mammogram and it turned out to be lymphoma and she's completely asymptomatic. I can feel some lymph nodes under her arm, but she doesn't, they're not causing any pain, not causing any symptoms, but she's really wrestling with the thought that she has a cancer or lymphoma in her body, but there's nothing that needs to be done about it right now because actually we may do more harm than good if we went forward with treating. Mm -hmm. And so what we'll do in that kid situation is have the patient come see us every three months and do a physical exam, do lab tests, and then we're always available if something happens in, in between those visits, if there's a new symptom that develops and we can make an intervention sooner if needed. But that's really, it's hard for people to get used to sometimes because their, their thought that you have cancer in your body and there's nothing to do about it right now is, can be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, there are some really exciting treatments available for these diseases. So rituximab, I had mentioned earlier, it targets a protein called CD20 on the surface of the B cells and it can directly kill lymphoma cells. It's a very important part of our treatment. It's the R and the R-CHOP that I've mentioned a couple times. There's a newer oral medicine that's directed for CLL, the disease that we were talking about, and Waldenstrom's another type of lymphoma that directly blocks the signaling of a B cell receptor. So it's another targeted treatment. Now these, these types of newer treatments, they, they aren't side effect free. They still cause some side effects, but they're usually much better tolerated than chemotherapy. Now immunotherapies I've mentioned, which help to switch on the immune system for a person's body to fight the cancer better. We're studying many of these currently in clinical trials in lymphomas wanted to talk about the aggressive or fast-growing lymphomas that are curable. Um, DLBCL, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, is the most common. The median age, most people are, are in their 60s or 60s, 70s um, with, at diagnosis, and about two-thirds of them are cured with the treatment. And the first-line treatment, a newly di diagnosed patient often gets treatment with what's called R-CHOP, which I've mentioned a couple times. That is a chemotherapy that's given intravenously. It's five different medicines and it's given once every three weeks for six total treatments as an outpatient. Um, there, again, like, just like in Hodgkin lymphoma, if someone doesn't respond completely or if the disease keeps growing in spite of the, uh, in spite of the treatment, the second line is to give them a different chemotherapy and then go on to an autologous stem cell transplant. We are testing, and I, I just wanted to mention two clinical trials. We're working very hard, even though 65% is good compared to some of the diseases we talked about. We want it to be 100%. So we're working really hard to, uh, to come up with new strategies of targeting the lymphoma cells in addition to chemotherapy. So we have a clinical trial with a drug called azacitidine, uh, along with the RCHOP for newly diagnosed patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma and then also a new drug called Selenexor, uh, plus a second line chemotherapy in people who didn't respond well to the first type of treatment for DLBCL. And we work very closely with our laboratory colleagues, so we have some 
brilliant scientists here who are helping us develop these medicines. They're doing a lot of testing in, um, in early um, models that aren't in humans, and some of them are, are, are using what's called cell lines, and some of them are using my, mouse models to help us figure out exactly the best strategy to, um, to go after for these diseases to really try to improve the, the cure rates of them. I wanted to now talk about multiple myeloma. This is a disease that occurs, it's diagnosed in about 30,000 patients per year in the U.S. The five-year survival is about 50%, but this is improving dramatically as there are more and more new therapies coming out for this disease. Uh, this is what the, the multiple myeloma cells look like in the bone marrow. This is called plasma cells, and they, some people think they look a bit like fried eggs. So multiple myeloma is also kind of like some of the non-Hodgkin lymphomas that I mentioned. It doesn't always require treatment. So there's what's called the CRAB criteria that we use. When one of these CRAB criteria is met, then treatment is usually indicated. So I mentioned calcium being high as a, a problem that can happen with multiple myeloma, and that's because it can involve the bones, and when bones are um, infiltrated with bad cells, they can release calcium into the body. And kidneys are also commonly affected in multiple myeloma, so renal or kidney failure is an indication for treatment of myeloma. Anemia or red blood cells being low is another reason to treat myeloma, and then bone lesions, like I mentioned, uh, is, the, is the final, the B of the crab. Importantly, this is not directly a, a cancer treatment, but there's a, there, there are medicines that are uh, called bisphosphonates, which strengthen the bone and help to prevent fractures in people with multiple myeloma, and they're very important treatments. So this is similar to Fosamax that, that some of you might know of from osteoporosis, or similar types of medicine. We often give this type of medicine through the IV intravenous route when it's being given for multiple myeloma. In general, the modern treatment approaches for my myeloma are to minimize chemotherapy using targeted drugs. I've mentioned targeted a lot, so we're trying to come up with ways to directly kill the myeloma cells. So there's some drugs, um, lenalidomide. This is actually related to the old drug thalidomide, which I'm sure you all recall from, um, from days in the past. And bortezomib is another um, targeted type medicine, and there are more and more of these drugs that are being um, developed for myeloma, so there, there are many, many treatment options um, and more on the way for this disease, and um, they generally have fewer side effects than chemotherapy. Um, treatment for this disease is often ongoing um, until disease progression, until the disease grows, um, or until um, there are uh, side effects that make it so that the patient really can't tolerate it. So one side effect we watch for really carefully, as I mentioned earlier, is numbness and tingling of the fingers and toes. And this is not a clear-cut um, treatment strategy, but some, um, some doctors will recommend autologous stem cell transplant in multiple myeloma. Um, but because of all of the newer therapies, it definitely is becoming less popular than it was, say, 10 years ago. I wanted to mention some practical issues regarding myeloma treatment. Bone fractures are common because of the involvement of bone in the disease, and sometimes they require either surgery or radiation treatment to relieve the pain. In this disease, patients may initially come into the hospital with symptoms like confusion or nausea, vomiting. Um, that may be a symptom of the high calcium I've mentioned that can happen with this disease, but most of the treatment can be given as an outpatient. So they may be in the hospital for short term, but not as common for people with myeloma to be in the hospital to actually receive their treatment. One major goal is to maintain normal kidney function in these patients. So we always ask people to drink a lot of fluids and to not take medicines that can hurt the kidneys. So uh, Advil or um, Aleve, ibuprofen, naproxen, these types of medicines can be bad for the kidneys. It's not something you need to avoid if you have normal kidney function. Um, and don't have myeloma, but when you do have that disease, we really want to avoid that, those medicines. Um, there are multiple new therapies that are coming out, as I've mentioned, um, and uh, 
they're often indicated when other treatments are not effective. Our myeloma center, as I've mentioned, um, similar to our other, our other blood cancer treatment groups, are also studying really promising treatments and clinical trials, uh, including immunotherapy and myeloma. I will finish with some take-home points. Uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma are the most common blood cancers. Uh, blood cancers can cause side effects related to the abnormal number and function of their, red, of their blood cells, infection, fatigue, bleeding, and bruising. Treatments vary by disease and subtype. So you saw I've mentioned so many different treatments, and I, the reason I put a lot of detail in the slides is so that you could go back later and look at it because I know it's hard to sort it all out because I went through so many different diseases and treatments, but that was part to, to show you how complex these diseases are and how important it is to make sure that we have the most accurate diagnosis. And um, you know, I feel very strongly here at Cornell that we have excellent pathologists who work together with our hematologists and oncologists and help us feel very certain about the diagnoses that we make so that we can recommend the, the right treatment for each individual patient. Side effects of chemotherapy I mentioned include fatigue, increased infection risk, hair loss, nausea, vomiting, heart toxicity, numbness, and tingling. And we, our, our primary goal here at Wild Cornell is to develop targeted therapy so that we can directly kill the blood cancer cells, boost the immune system, and decrease side effects. What is, what is heart toxicity? That's a good question. I was thinking as I said that, that wasn't clear. Um, so you remember earlier in the talk that I uh, mentioned that we do a echocardiogram at the beginning uh, before people start treatment. So um, one of the main types of treatments that's involved in, um, in leukemia and lymphoma is called, the category drug is called anthracycline, and it's known, it's usually years from now, like 20 years from now, it can cause some decrease in heart function in terms of its ability to pump. And so the main reason we want to check the heart function before we start is because if, if we found that someone's heart function was reduced at baseline at the beginning, then we would probably decrease the dose of that chemotherapy to lessen the risk of causing side effects to, or to harm the heart. I have also provided some contact information um, for our blood cancer programs here, um, and we have some blogs also for, with more information if you wanted to read about it for leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma, and then our, also our numbers here. If you, if you or a friend is interested in, in learning more, um, we wanted you to have that information available. And then I wanted to answer other questions that people have. PV. I did not mention PV. So polycythemia vera is a um, is a, is part of a different category of diseases. So I'm gonna I'm, I'll I'll mention it, it now. This is it's a category of diseases called myeloproliferative neoplasms. There's a there's about four or five different diseases that are categorized under that. PV is polycythemia vera, and it's a, pro it's a disease that affects the red blood cells. So that is a disease where the red blood cells are often high and can cause clotting problems. And um, what we do often for those diseases are sometimes what's called phlebotomy, where we can, as a therapeutic phlebotomy, where we actually draw off blood to keep a person that at a normal blood level, we worry about blood clots and heart attacks and strokes can be can be um, problems that happen with those patients. Another type of treatment is is a, a pill called hydroxyurea, which can help maintain the blood counts at a lower range. So I, I apologize. I, I was trying to think of how to fit all of this in, and I that it um, it was um, I felt was going to make it. Um, more complicated, but it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a relevant disease and affects a lot of people and, and is something that we're very focused on here as well. Do you ever recommend alternative medicine or supplements and other things that might help uh, eliminate the leukemia? That's a great question. It's probably one of the most common that I get. Um, I think that in general the alternative treatments aren't aren't often studied as rigorously as 
as um, chemotherapies and more traditional treatments. So I think some oncologists get a, a bit nervous about them. I think some of us are, are open to exploring, and there are some that are being studied in clinical trials. So I think w what we worry about sometimes is that we don't want to decrease the effectiveness of the more standard treatment by adding something in that we don't necessarily know exactly how it's working. But I think in certain circumstances, in, in close consultation with the doctor, that, that we will you know, we will be accepting of that type of strategy if, if there's enough information to support it. Because I read, um, IP6 with, an, with extra anestosol uh, kills leukemia cells. IP6? P6 plus some extra in this. Okay. I can't pronounce the word in this. Okay. I ha oh, I, I know what you're referring to. So I think so, and some of this is probably being tested in a lab, in a lab setting first, and it might be the type of, of um, uh, study that could be done in people at some point. So I don't specifically know about that compound that you mentioned, but I think uh, given the, the um, response rates of chemotherapy to the, the acute leukemia, that there's certainly a lot of research being done to try to figure out different alternative ways to get uh, to the, to the care with. I mean, I, um, one, one lady first. Um, I have a friend that has multiple lymphoma. Yes. She also has rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. And she has a right. She's on something called Synthicate Area. Okay. You ever hear of that drug? Synthicate Area. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Do you think that's a, a treatment for the rheumatoid arthritis or for the? It is life. right. Okay. So that disease is often associated. It can, it can be associated with um, autoimmune problems or with rheumatoid arthritis. So that makes sense to me that that there's a re, there's a, maybe a connection between those two diseases. But often that disease can be managed even sometimes by surgery or radiation or other therapies. So, so w one way of managing it, it's interesting that that one sometimes can be associated with a bacteria called H. pylori. You all may have heard of that bacteria. And so there's some antibiotic medicines sometimes that can, can can cure that disease. So I'm not, I think I may just not know the brand name that you're mentioning, um, but I'll. So um, how did we already get it probably diminishing? I don't think that's necessarily the case, uh, but it it does you know it it makes it a more complicated situation okay. because the person has another disease okay. to deal with. Too. Yes. Is there a count, a white blood count, that should alert me uh, when, when I get my blood count uh, right here? I mean, is it, ten thousand too high? Is seventy thousand a warning sign? So it's more about what the other blood counts are. So in, in oh. I think um, I don't I think that you're sharing some personal information so I can assess what you're talking about and I don't know how open you want me to be with the whole group. But I do want to say that um, the it, what you're describing I think um, indicates that you you don't have your the other blood counts are normal. So the big one of the big issues is is your red blood cells low, are your red blood cells or your platelet counts low, if they're normal, it doesn't matter so much what the exact white blood cell count number is. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, recently I read and I also have friends that came to my mind, uh, people that were put in remission for Hodgkin's, in the long term, is a higher risk to become uh, with Alzheimer? I haven't heard that directly, but I'm, I, that's a really interesting question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to investigate that. I, I, I don't know the data on that, but I would, I would be very uh, interested to learn about that. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Are they also doing research on what causes it? Yes, definitely. So I mentioned some risk factors, but we're working, we're, we're working to try to understand that better. Um, can these blood ca cancers be created by taking normal blood and inserting benzene or some pesticides like rat poison or uh, gardening poison? And if that's been done, has it been compared 
to um, people who actually have le leukemia, lymphoma, or you know these disorders, uh, can you actually create the disease from normal blood? In that, the lab? That's a great question. I. I don't know the answer to whether or not those experiments have been done. I would imagine someone's done something like that in, you know, obviously not in humans. That would be the ethical no, thing in, in the lab setting. I a, see. Something um, worth looking at. Right. I, I, I think it probably has been done, but I don't. I can't answer the specifics of it. It's an interesting point that you make, though, because that if we were to be able to study that, then maybe we could figure out how to yes. how to get rid of it better in those people or in, in that. Animal. Most of them done that they mentioned benzene as a. I think the way that we know that those exposures can be associated with blood cancers is because we go back and look at certain populations of people where a lot of them were exposed to this chemical and then they got this type of disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutherford. Thank you all. I appreciate it. And great audience, great questions. Yes, great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. There are handouts. There's a. Uh,